Hello and welcome to events. Um, to, <laughs> welcome to tonight's event at the Berkeley Forum. My name is Lucy Chang and I'm the president of this organization. And it brings me a lot of excitement to introduce tonight's event, which is the Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth with Sam Quinones, um, author and journalist covering the opioid, opioid ec epidemic. Oh my goodness. Um, before we get started, um, we will. We begin all our events with an attendance form. So please fill out the form tinyurl.com backslash communis attendance. And I'd also like to encourage everyone in the audience to submit questions at tinyurl.com backslash communis attendance, um, which we will be um, asking during the event. I'd also like to begin this event with a land acknowledgement. The Berkeley Forum would like to take this time to acknowledge that our event and UC Berkeley's campus sit on the territory of the Ohlone people and that we benefit from the occupation of this land. It is important that we recognize the history out of respect to the Muwekma Ohlone who are not who are still present in Berkeley in the Bay Area today. For more native education resources on campus, we encourage you to look into the Centers of Educational Justice and Community Engagement. And with that, I'd like to pass things off to my incredible event manager for the night, Riley Collins. Hi there. Sam is a Tennessee-based freelance journalist, former LA Times reporter, and author of four narrative nonfiction books. He graduated from UC Berkeley with a degree in economics and American history and has published multiple nonfiction books on the drug epidemic and been placed on various best books lists. In 2015, he published his best-selling book, Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opioid Epidemic, which awakened the country to the nationwide epidemic of addiction to opioids and heroin. His latest book is The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth, which chronicles how the epidemic has evolved from opioids into illicit synthetic drugs. I will now pass it off to Sam for his speaker address. There we go. Okay. Great. Thank you, Riley. Thanks, ladies. I appreciate your, um, your uh, uh, invitation to come speak to you all tonight. I um, hope you all are doing well. Um, I am, uh, uh, as uh, Riley said, a longtime reporter, journalist. I've written two books about the opioid epidemic. And um, we don't have a lot of time and these topics are enormous and very vast. So I just wanted to really kind of confine myself to a uh, a few parts of, of what I've uh, written, because uh, we really don't have time for even more than that. Um, but uh, I wanted to start out by saying that when I wrote my first book on this topic, Dreamland, right there, um, I, was, uh, I was writing the book and, and as I was doing so, uh, I encountered um, I knew that it was a, it was a national story, you know, enormous in scope, and yet everywhere I went, I found an, a, a deafening silence. Nobody really wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to. Nobody wanted to have their uh, you know their loved one's addiction mentioned in public. Uh, certainly not in obituaries. On and I was a real silent kind of thing. Um, and uh, I was thinking at that time that, okay, I'm going to write this book, I signed up to write it, but it's going to fail because nobody really wants to talk about this topic. And um, the topic was huge. Uh, I mean, it was, it was about who we were as a country, you know, we, it was about um, how, uh, uh, you know, what we did. it was about um, us as Americans wanting kind of ease of convenience and, and therefore when doctors came to us and said um, uh, you need to uh, um, uh, lose weight, you need to exercise, you need to eat better, uh, stop smoking, stop drinking. As Americans, we pushed back on that. We said, no, doctors give us, we want pills. We want an easy, convenient way of dealing with, um, with our problems. Um, and that gave rise, that was part of what gave rise to a widespread use of opioid painkillers all across America for a good 20 years. There was a lot to it. Don't have time to really go into it right now. But I wrote this book and uh, the chronicles that and it chronicles uh, um, the first um, real um, Mexican trafficking organization 
to be able to figure that figured out that if you follow the pain pills, the opioid pain pills, they would they would have an enormous new market of of uh, heroin, which is exactly uh, what happened all across the country. They were the first ones to figure it out. Anyway, I published this book 2015 and um, and uh, I was stunned to watch as 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 the months passed and uh, that uh, the silence began to break. The sounds began, people began, began to open up, come out of the shadows. It was a remarkable thing to watch. One of the great social movements of our time, in fact, except for that nobody recognizes it as, uh, as such because there's no organization to it. There's no spokeswoman or, or press release or what have you. It's just people coming out of the shadows, being heard, uh, telling their stories for the first time. That began to happen shortly after Dreamland um, uh, came out. I felt this very, very viscerally. It could, uh, uh, and, and what began to happen to me was um, I began to get these speaking engagements, which I did not expect. My, my wife and I were stunned to see them happen, come out. Uh, and so I began, to, I began to accept them and go wherever they wanted me to go in small towns and conferences of professional doctors and public health and judges and narcotics agents and all the rest. Just one, and, and every year it seemed to double. Meanwhile, my, my publisher, began to say, we need another book. You need to write another book about this topic. And I was like, well, I'm exhausted. Dreamland um, was one of the most complicated books I could imagine. I really couldn't imagine writing a more complicated uh, a book, keeping all these storylines in my head and, and all that, and enormous, enormous amounts of research required. Um, I could still see that the story was morphing. I could see that it was nationwide, but I was exhausted. And the other thing was, I was thinking, I'm a crime reporter, basically. That's what I've done most of my life is cover crime, and I find it fascinating and all. Um, I was still thinking a little old school at that point. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, after all, what is, what comes, what could be worse? My thought was, what could be worse than heroin? Right? At the time, I couldn't imagine anything worse than heroin, you know, and then I, just because you write a book doesn't mean you can predict the future, you know. But as I as I began to do these speeches, as the silence began to break, I began to travel around the country uh, in, in, you know, dozens of times a year. And it was there that I began to figure out what comes after heroin, What's, what could be worse than heroin. Uh, and the answer is is fentanyl. Uh, in fact, as I began to understand what was happening, I could see what was really going on was an enormous change in the drug trafficking world in Mexico. Now, I knew this world fairly well because I'd lived in Mexico for 10 years, wrote two books. My two first books were about uh, Mexico. Excuse me. And, um, and, and the, the trafficking world in Mexico is largely... Uh, rooted in the land, in uh, you know the ranch. They were their original ones were ranchers and farmers and so on. And but I began to realize as I was traveling the country, and I began to talk with folks and understand what was happening. That a major shift was underway down in Mexico. That it had enormous impact up here, and that was the the shift away from plant based drugs, away from the land, towards synthetic drugs. Synthetic drugs had for traffickers enormous benefits they 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 dwarfed by quite a bit anything you could grow and the reason is that if you if you are making synthetic drugs you these are drugs that are made in a lab with chemicals no plant involved whatsoever that means that means you don't need a lot of things to you reduce your cost you don't need land nor green or sunlight you don't need farmers i mean there's all these things you just so, uh, constrict the supply chain remarkably. All you really need, all you really need is shipping ports. And the Mexican trafficking world controls shipping ports um, uh, on the western side of Mexico, uh, about two days drive south of Arizona, you get there. And with shipping ports, the reason those are important is because if you control shipping ports, you get access to the world's chemical markets. You can get all the chemicals that you need to make the drugs that you, you want. And if you control the, the, the areas, if you control the ports, you can make these drugs in staggering 
staggering quantities, which is exactly what's happening now, has been happening in the United States over the last several years. We are seeing the result of all that. Remember, with, with, with synthetic drugs, you don't have seasons. There are no more seasons. With marijuana, with poppies, there are seasons. There are no seasons with, with synthetic drugs. You can make them all year round, provided that you get the chemicals. And that is what really began to happen. Um, well, actually, you know, the, the trafficking world figured this out down in Mexico in the 90s with methamphetamine. They began making methamphetamine, industrialize it, made it in fairly large quantities, but they were always limited by the amount of a precursor chemical that they get, a, a chemical known as ephedrine. Ephedrine, you've probably had it. In fact, it's a, it's in, it's a decongestant, it's in Sudafed pills, that kind of thing. And you know, a few little chemical tweaks that it becomes methamphetamine. They, they mastered that, they industrialized it, but they never could get their hands on as enough ephedrine to really do more than cover much of the Western United States, not all of it. And it never really went, their meth never really went east of the Mississippi River in any great, great quantities. Um, all that began to change in the uh, mid 2000s. First of all, it really changed with um, meth with with fentanyl. The Sinaloa drug cartel in the uh, in 2006 discovered kind of fentanyl. Discovered that there was a synthetic version of heroin. They discovered this through a um, an, uh, uh, an underground chemist they had hired to make what they thought they thought he was going to make ephedrine. It turns out he thought he was a smart guy and he thought, no, I'm going to make fentanyl and they'll thank me. And when they found out, they were pretty mad. Hey, why are you making this other stuff we don't even know anything about? But he said, look, here's the thing. The stuff that I've made for you right here is the most potent, profitable drug you will ever, use, you will ever come across in your entire uh, careers. You can cut this stuff 50 times. That means one kilo can make 50 kilos of saleable product on the, on the street. No one had ever heard of such a thing. But in fact, the lights begin to go on and they begin to think, oh my God, fentanyl. It's just like we, we made, we're making methamphetamine. That taught us kind of the basic lessons that it's better to make your drugs than grow them. Well, now we've got another option here. We don't have to grow poppies any, anymore. I should stop and say that fentanyl, you know, is a magnificent drug when used medically in surgery. It's revolutionary. I've had fentanyl myself. Many, many, maybe your parents have had fentanyl. Many people have had fentanyl. So it's, it's a common drug used in in surgery, and it revolutionized surgery, made many kinds of surgery possible. The reason it did is because it's a very quick in and out kind of drug. So you 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 get into anesthesia quickly, and you get out of it very quickly. Um, it's very very potent, far more potent than heroin far more important than mor mor morphine. Um, and it revolutionized surgery. Of course, it's, it's a disaster though, in the hands of the underworld. And that's what began to happen uh, right in about 2014. The, the underground chemist they hired later went to prison, they lost him. The Chinese began importing, exporting um, uh, 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 fentanyl. Uh, understanding there was this gradual awakening that if you can get your hands on fentanyl, you can make a killing. The problem is, of course, the drug is extraordinarily uh, a potent. So what you begin to see is um, is uh, uh, increases in overdoses, fatal overdoses begin to start, begin to rise, beginning primarily 2014, 15, 16. You really begin to see fentanyl becoming bigger and bigger part of the, of the of the overdose story across the country, starting first really in the areas most hard uh, worst hit by the opioid epidemic, which would be you know Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, Indiana, Tennessee, et cetera, those those states in there. But as time goes on, it begins to spread, it begins to spread, and it reaches California. And I think the first mass overdose was in Chico. It was about two thousand, I think, eighteen, something like that. Anyway, um, as time goes on, they really achieve what has never happened before, and that is that one group covers the entire country with actually not one drug, but two, fentanyl and methamphetamine. And they do this because they have unfettered access to the world chemical markets through those ports and because they control law enforcement in Mexico and can produce as much as they possibly want. Fentanyl, the, the enormous supplies, I'll talk about methamphetamine in just a minute, 
um, and then we can open it up for questions uh, because it looks like time is really racing here. Okay, um, fentanyl it democratizes drug traffic. So anybody, there's so much of it, anybody can be a, a drug trap, a, a kingpin, right? It also pr uh, prompts a lot of dealers on the street to add it to the stuff, add it to cocaine. Why would you add a drug that will kill somebody um, uh, to a drug like cocaine? You know, why would you want to lose your customer? There's good business reasons on the street for doing so. If you if you use um, um, if you put fentanyl into cocaine, very quickly you go from getting one customer who buys your cocaine once 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 a week, or once every few days, maybe once every two weeks, to a person who's an opioid addict addicted to fentanyl. If he survives, he's going to be addicted to fentanyl. And when that happens, he has to buy every single day. No vacation from fentanyl. No vac You have to keep the dope sickness away. It's that ferocious. And so that's what begins to happen. Dealers on the street began to realize, hey, I could put this stuff in, in cocaine. I could put it in methamphetamine. There's some examples of it being uh, put in marijuana. I don't know how many exactly. I don't think too many, but nevertheless, there are some cases of this, I think. And um, <clears throat> that's because it is so damn prevalent. You can put it into, and it's like almost like we put salt on food. That's kind of the way dealers kind of look at fun. You can put it in anything and it'll boost your profits. It'll boost your, your potential for getting a new kind of customer, a customer who has to buy every single day. Fentanyl is a torment for users. It's not something people want. It's something that they've been kind of transitioned to by this massive supply coming out, supply creating demand coming out of, of, uh, of, of, of Mexico. And so, and it's actually a torment because of that, what I told you, fentanyl takes you in and out of, of, um, of uh, you, you know, your, your anesthesia, but also your high very quickly. That means that you don't get a long, long respite from your dope sickness. Pretty soon, the addicts I've talked to have always said it's four to six hours and you got to use again. And sometimes you end up using three, four, five times a day, where it was with heroin, it'd be like once or twice, depending on your tolerance and, and all that, which, which is a deadly thing because the problem with fentanyl is on the street, you have to, in order to sell it, you have to mix it. Such a small amount of fentanyl can be, get you high and a little bit more can kill you. These are, we're talking about the equivalent of a few grains of salt. So you can't sell a, a few grains on the street, just not feasible. You have to mix it with other powder and then you can sell the powder in, in larger little packets. Uh, and the problem is nobody knows how to actually mix these things very well. They're not, they're not pharmaceutical mixers. They're guys on the street. They're, you know, idiots. They don't know what they're doing. They're all profit motivated. They don't care. And so that's what also begins to happen. You begin to see these awful mixes. And early on in fentanyl's, uh, um, fentanyl's life on the streets began in 2014. Early on, you began to see all these major uh, clusters of overdose deaths because the mix was so awful. It was so bad. Um, and so basically, that that's what began to, to happen. We began to see poor mixes, overdose deaths begin to rise, all kinds of people getting into it. It kind of democratizes, as I said, the drug trafficking business. Anybody could sell it. You could buy it on the internet initially from the Chinese. Um, and then as time went on, the Mexicans kind of took it over. The, the Chinese government put a, put a regulation in place. Only a few companies could make fentanyl anymore. But the, 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 the chemical companies in Mexico still made the ingredients. They began to ship the ingredients through those ports in Mexico to the traffickers in Mexico. And now what we have really is an entire fentanyl industry down in Mexico supplied by Chinese chemical makers, uh, creating enormous quantities of fentanyl that are essentially trans transforming kind of casual drug users, opioid addicts, non-drug users into, into opioid addicts and expanding demand by in, with enormous uh, application of, 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 of supply. Now the, the, the and fentanyl is being put into counterfeit uh, pills that you're seeing everywhere now. It's just unbelievable quantities of these pills. Now um, you've got that, that look very much like legitimate Percocets or Xanax bars or, or uh, oxycodone 30, 30 milligram generic uh, 
30 milligram pills, you know, all with the pharmaceutical mind looks very, they look all very much like the original, the, the legitimate pill. But of course, all they contain is fentanyl. All of this, again, it gets back to the idea that this is a synthetic era now. And with synthetics, you can make drugs all year round, right? Um, and so uh, a similar thing was happening with, with methamphetamine. Um, methamphetamine, as I said, was made for many years down in Mexico, kind of industrialized with the, the, the ephedrine method, using as a principal chemical the ephedrine, the, the anesthetic, I told, the, I'm sorry, the decongestant that I told you about. Um, however, that began to change after the Mexican government in 2008 put strict regulations on the importation of ephedrine and made it so that only a few companies could make uh, uh, could, could make could could possess uh, uh, ephedrine. So much reduced supply, and and this forced the um, the trafficking world in Mexico on the western side of Mexico around Guadalajara pr primarily over over in the state of Jalisco. Um, uh, this forced the trafficking world to then switch methods. Now it had huge import for our um, uh, for our country and uh, the Bay Area, uh, one of the areas very hard hit by this, because the method that they find is to them a new method. Actually, it's an old method. The, the biker gangs, the Hells Angels used to use this method back in the 60s. It's a very inefficient method. It's very messy, stinks, but um, and it has one benefit. And the benefit is that you can make the precursor, the essential precursor ingredient, many different ways. The ingredient is known as P2P, phenol 2 propanone. You can make phenol 2 propanone many, many, many. There's all kinds of chemical hacks to make that, that chemical. The combinations of chemicals that you use to make P2P are, are many, and they're all, most of them involve very widely available industrial chemicals, chemicals that are legal, toxic, and, but widely available, used in all kinds of, of industries. So if government cracks down on this way of making P2P, you can make it this way and this way and all these different ways. And if you have access to world chemical markets, as they do down in Mexico now, you can begin to make so much methamphetamine, you can be, make, make more methamphetamine you ever thought possible. And that's what really begins to happen in about 2013, 14, a few years after yeah, there's some controls over methamphetamine in the, in the underworld. One guy, Nacho Coronel, very important visionary in, in the methamphetamine, me Mexican methamphetamine world, is killed in a firefight with, with soldiers. The, the, the control begins to break. And, and, and very soon, what you begin to see is an enormous, enormous supplies coming out of Mexico of methamphetamine. And you begin then to see the drug kind of march its way gradually across the United States, starting on the West Coast, in LA, San Francisco, up into Seattle, Phoenix, Vegas, et cetera, all of those places. By in 2013, 14, it dislodges, amazing, amazing to think about it, but it dislodges crack from LA Skid Row. I never thought I'd ever see anything but crack on LA Skid Row, and now it's pretty much all methamphetamine. It moves across to the Midwest by say 2017, and then gets up into 2000 in 2019 into New England, which never had any meth at all. In the Midwest, the, the meth was very scarce. It was made in these kind of like home brew kind of things and little Mountain Dew bottles and stuff. And But you're talking about grams that people were able to make, maybe ounces. And here we come with multi-kilo, constant multi-kilo loads of, of, of methamphetamine. And that riot goes up into the... Um, now into uh, New England. It's a stunning, again, another stunning achievement made possible only by the supply that is made possible by switching to synthetic drugs using only chemicals and having those chemicals easily available from these from these ports. So you see by 2000, really 2018, 19, you see the entire country effectively, there's some areas where it's not there, but effectively the entire country has methamphetamine all across um, 
uh, uh, the country at the same time. It's an amazing story too, because they not only cover the country, but the price drops. It's an amazing idea. I'm, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee right now. And, um, and they, uh, um, uh, you know, the price for methamphetamine used to be $19,000. Today it's $3,000. It's an 80 percent price drop you're seeing 80 percent price drops all across the country every place all the addicts all the cops are all reporting the same the same kind of price drop over the last five or six years depending on where where you are and when when, when it showed up in your your area um it's just a stunning thing but there's another part to that story that i found later as i was just about to finish the book and that is this that the methamphetamine now being made, it's new to the Mexican trafficking world and new in, the, in, the, in, the, in their, their ability to make just catastrophic quantities of the stuff, is also accompanied as it marches across the country. It's also accompanied by rapid onset, severe symptoms of mental illness, rapid psychosis, paranoia, intense paranoia, uh, 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 hallucinations. But with ephedrine, the ephedrine-based meth was kind of a party drug, social drug. You were everybody's best friend. You were yakking away all night. You stayed up for three or four nights. Eventually, you'd start to see sleep deprivation. You'd start to see like shadow people off in the corner of your eye. But not so with this stuff. This stuff was very solitary. It pushed people inward got very, very weird. You were convinced that the entire world was out to get, kill you. I talked to a guy the other day about his experience, first experience after years of using ephedrine meth. He uses this new P2P stuff. And, and, and he says, I prepared myself to die because I knew that all around me were all these people trying to kill me. He left his mom's car at a gas station and ran off into the city, fleeing the, in, in terror, um, all this stuff. Um, so the methamphetamine that we um, we are now seeing on the streets is, in my opinion, very strong driver, if not the strongest driver of um, a mental illness on our streets. The homelessness that you see is very often connected to um, to uh, uh, methamphetamine and uh, the tent encampments as well, I believe, are almost a barometer now of how bad the mess is because it's driving people to mental illness and an inability to live with everybody else, not wanting to live with anybody else. And the tent encampment is then becomes the perfect place, a, a little tent, a little pod where you can protect yourself from the world. And then you, the psychosis maybe drops off a little bit and there's everybody around you is, is using the drug so you can get more of it if you want. Anyway, um, I'm getting a little signs that maybe it's time to, to wrap it up. It's uh, time just slips so quickly when you're talking about this stuff. But that is the situation on our streets today. Unprecedented amounts of, of, of dope. There is no such thing as recreation, risk-free rec recreational drug use in America anymore. All the old myths of how deadly and crazy and all that stuff the drugs w were, which none of us believed in the 1970s when I was coming up. In fact, none of that was really too true. All of that's become reality. It's all true. There is no such thing as a risk-free drug taken on the street. Um, and that's the situation we find ourselves in today. Anyway, I'll stop there and leave it open to any questions you or the moderator uh, uh, of at the forum have. Yeah, thank you, Sam, so much for joining us at the forum and as well as for that insightful talk. For my first question of the evening, I wanted to touch upon this theme you talked about on P2P meth. As you've highlighted, there's no central driver of the P2P meth story. With no one route to address this issue, what direction can policymakers take to address rising P2P availability? You know, it's a really, really good question. I think what one of the things that needs to happen is we need to understand that leaving people on the street is not a compassionate thing to do when you've got P2P and fentanyl on the street. Fentanyl is a, is a really exercise in, a, in Russian roulette, okay? Very, very deadly. There's no such thing as a long-term fentanyl user. Methamphetamine is a, is a drug that drives you very crazy and, and, and is likely from the people I've spoken with to be creating uh, significant brain damage among many people who are out on the street. I think we need to, 
We need to find ways of take, getting people off the street. I do believe that we have tried, we've tried the, the, uh, in the last few years, um, the idea of decriminalizing drugs. I think that is a disaster when it comes to these drugs because anything that leaves people on the street risks their death and then their, um, or, or their mental illness, their, their, their brain damage. And I think we need to start thinking in ways of using arrest powers to get people off the street. I think one part of the, the thing I think is very important is that we need to rethink jail. Jail has been a disaster, generally speaking, although for some people, if some addicts swear by it, they think the best day of their life was when they got arrested. That was where they got separation from the dope that allowed them to live and, and they'd otherwise they'd be dead. But in general, jail is not a good thing. It needs, it can be though. And you're seeing experiments with jail in the areas where the opioid epidemic hit hardest and longest, Ohio, Kentucky, places like that you're seeing. And I think that's what needs to happen. We need to begin to use jail as a place where recovery can begin. Up to now, it's just been a place where you just languish, you just vegetate, nothing, a lot of times, nothing really good happens there. There's often predatory and all that. I think jail needs to be rethought. We need to start using um, uh, arresting powers to get people off the street because there is, nobody is going to be ready for treatment on the street. That is not what's happening on the street. The drugs are too deadly. Our thinking on this stuff was formed 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Meanwhile, the drugs have radically, radically changed. So we need to re un understand that there is no readiness. You're not going to come all of a sudden with an epiphany. Oh, I've got to get treatment today. It just doesn't happen. Fentanyl will kill you quicker than ever. You know, I spoke with a drug court judge in um, in West Virginia, and, and I said, you know, who who are your clients? He said, they're fentanyl addicts, almost I mean, methamphetamine addicts, almost entirely. And I said, well, what about the fentanyl users? He says, they they all die. They don't live. There's two. It's people die too quickly. We have to you know, if we want to keep people alive, we have to get them off the street. That's the story of our drugs uh, today on, uh, in America. I think. Much of your journalism focuses on small towns in the Midwest, as you mentioned, in Ohio, um, that have been the centers of substance use disorder. However, substance use disorders also affect cities. In San Francisco last year, about 650 people died from fentanyl overdoses. In yeah. your experience reporting, have you found there to be differences in what contributes to overdose trends in smaller Midwest towns compared to cities such as San Francisco? Well, <sighs> <laughs> um, in the case, specific case of San Francisco, now I don't live there, and um, and so, but I do follow very closely. I um, talk to a lot of people from there, and I've I, I read the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, subscribe to it, and Twitter. I follow it a lot. My feeling is in San Francisco, what's happened is that you have a DA over there who's decided that that all drug sales are are harmless endeavors. And that therefore people shouldn't be uh, charged with minor drug sales. The problem is, again, that the drugs have changed. This is not small quantities of marijuana 20 years ago. This is fentanyl. Fentanyl is every bit like firing a gun into a crowd. So if you have, uh, if you if, if you sell fentanyl, it's almost in, almost in, inconceivable that it would not harm somebody and very likely will kill somebody. And so, and still, the the DA over there seems to think that there is no difference between. And so, what you're seeing now over in San Francisco is a very different situation than out in, mid, in the Midwest. You're seeing double the number of fentanyl of overdose deaths in San Francisco than than they had of COVID. And that's largely, in my opinion, because it seems that that, that I would say it seems that the, the the cause is that there there's been this uh, change in how they approach. Um, minor drug sales. And so people get arrested for cops arrest them, but they don't stay in jail. They don't, they're out very quickly. They continue to sell and people continue to overdose. Remember, there is no such thing as a long-term fentanyl user on the street. They all die. And so that is what you're in Francisco. In the, in the Midwestern towns, 
a lot of that goes back, I think, to the opioid epidemic, the pain pill prescribing, and you get people who are strung out dating from a really bad um, uh, uh, wanton prescribing of these of these pills. And when you get that, then they they never really break away from that world. They're, they and, and along comes fentanyl, and they just switch to fentanyl. But fentanyl, they don't have they don't have um, tolerance. For fentanyl, even though they've been using dope for a long time, they do not have tolerance for it. And that's what you're finding out, out, out there. There is a, there's just a whole population in those small towns that has been addicted for a long time and part of the drug world. They really have not been able to move beyond it. And they were like empty vessels awaiting, waiting prey in a sense when, when fentanyl began to come out. Expanding on this topic of substance reporting and trends, a big theme in this field is language. The opioid crisis is well characterized as an epidemic, implying that the crisis is a public health issue. Yet substance usage disorders aren't always characterized as an epidemic. In your experience reporting, what informs how a substance usage disorder crisis is characterized? Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I would buy that idea. I mean, I covered, I was a crime reporter during the crack epidemic and we never called it anything but an epidemic back then. I would say there are a few things that were um, uh, at, at play um, as, com as comparing the two things, because I covered both of them. I was in Stockton, uh, California as a crime reporter in Stockton in 80, from 80, 88 to 92, I think it was, and I covered uh, uh, full time, basically the effects of the crack epidemic. And I never called it anything but a crack epidemic in, in my writing or in my, my speech. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but, but um, and, and I would say that crack got far, far more um, um, media uh, uh, um, uh, attention than the opioid epidemic ever did. Um, remarkable, just nationwide stuff. Part of that was because the opioid, the crack epidemic was mostly, it was rooted in crack, but really the manifestation of it was in public violence. Drive-by shootings, street gangs, I covered this endlessly in Stockton and, other, and, 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 and could watch it in other towns, Sacramento, you know, various places, LA, San Francisco, Oakland, et cetera, where you found that the drug problem was accompanied by very public violence, drive-by shootings, carjacking is essentially a crime that was invented during the crack epidemic, um, formation of gangs, very well funded. They bought a lot of weapons. They fought over territory. All of that stuff came along with the crack epidemic. And I do not, I have to say, I covered, Stockton's one of the most integrated towns in California. It's 40%, when I was there, it was 40% white, 60% everything else, every other race, every other ethnicity, religion, et, et cetera. And when I was there, I do not remember anybody not one, not one person. Well, maybe a couple of people, but not certainly not one one group or, or neighbors in, of, of any part of the town who was ever cr calling for more treatment for addicts. It was get these guys off the street and in jail because life had become unbearable, particularly for working class uh, neighborhoods, black Latino neighborhoods. Uh, it was it was impossible. You couldn't walk to school. I mean, the first the first week I was on the job, I walked by an elementary school and there was a long line of crack dealers right there, 30, 40 guys. Um, so I don't remember anybody back then saying we need more treatment. The opioid epidemic is dramatically different. First of all, there's a, there's it's a very quiet epidemic. It's people say it only we only paid attention to it because white people got involved, middle class. And I would say there's a you got to flip that on its head. The only reason the, the, it remains silent. Because white people were in, primarily involved. And the reason for that is that they didn't want they, they didn't make it make it public. There was no outward manifestation, criminal manifestation. There was no drive by shootings, gangs, anything like that. It was a very quiet thing and and their obituaries were also always fabricating cause of death they didn't want anybody to know how their kid died why their brother died why their uh, husband uh, or wife died it was it was hidden it was and i i lived this in my own writings and so on um i would say too that now you're seeing um in, in uh, uh, enormous focus on treatment 
was never the case during the, uh, the, uh, the, the crack epidemic. Largely, um, people now say, well, the, the reason was that it was because it largely affected the black community. That's true. Um, there was this feeling like it's not us. It's not, it's somebody else. I don't really care. So a lot of particularly white people in America just didn't want to, to feel the kind of Christian charity that they are now asking for when their, their kids or their family is involved in some way. That's absolutely true. On the other hand, there's, there's some, there's a lot to it. It's not just as easy as to say, well, it's a, it's a kind of a racial feeling, a racist idea that, that somehow uh, not me. So I don't care about them. It's, it's that, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the opioid epidemic had no violence associated with it. And the other thing is we have come, we have seen enormous improvements and innovations and deeper, deeper understanding of the brain in the last 20 years. The machines that allow us to do that weren't even invented until the mid 1990s, well before, after the crack epidemic. So we've come to this deeper understanding of how our brains work, I think. And it's easier to tell that story because all these machines are, have very, very vivid uh, uh, images. And that means that you've, you've got a, a, a much deeper understanding that, that, that this is somehow connected to brain chemistry and we need to understand the brain chemistry and treat the brain chemistry. This is not a moral failing always. It's a, it's a, it's a problem that, that, that we all have. We can, all of us have that because we have the, the, the treatment that we have the same brain. We all have the same brain chemistry. So there's a knowledge base that did not exist. Uh, even 20 years ago, really, I think, in, in, in neuroscience. All of that means this epidemic, the lack of violence, the racial component, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the neuroscience advances, all of that means we are treating this epidemic very differently than we treated the crack epidemic of the late 80s, early 90s. For the sake of time, this will be my last question before we move on to audience questions. Your latest book, The Least of Us, explores the theme of hope in the time of fentanyl and meth. While you describe it as a challenging issue, what hope have you found in reporting on this story? Um, yeah, given the amount of time we have, that's a toughie because that's really the heart of the book um, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, basically, the idea, though, is to say that that we as a culture turned our back on what allowed us to survive as a, as a, as a species. In America, we turned our back on it largely, and that is this deep, deep connection to community. Um, if you think about it, that's why we survived as a species. We, we owe our existence to this idea that we've always had, that was kind of bred into us, evolved. We evolved to understand that, that we need each other deeply. And in the last 40 years, you know, all through history, you know, uh, people have understood this. They may not like getting along with other people. It's messy. They don't like them. It's they're jerks. They're politically religious differences, all that kind of stuff. Of course, racial differences, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. But basically, um, as a community, as a, as a species, we kind of more or less hung together. I would say in the United States in the last 40 years, we have decided we don't need that. Right. That we have all this prosperity. We don't need to hang out with other people. We can be alone in our screens and our homes and all that kind of stuff. And my feeling is that the epidemic, also the pandemic, actually, frankly, Black Lives Matter, too, is showing us, you know, that we need just how much we need each other. We cannot advance without addressing pain long ignored in certain communities. We can, we, we, the pa pandemic showed us we absolutely need each other. And the op opioid epidemic showed us what happens when you decide that you can go it alone and kind of be on your own and, and, and not help communities that need help when, say, the jobs go abroad and that, that kind of thing. And so to me, that uh, I, I kind of keep up to that because it, you, I could go on quite a long time on that topic. But the idea is that these, uh, this epidemic or this, these com combination of forces are showing us that, that what we need to get back to as a culture, if we learn it, there's a very hopeful message. If we learn, if we choose to to take it, if we choose to imply, incorporate it into each of our individual lives, it's calling us to think of how we live 
what, uh, what we eat, what, what news we consume, who, you know, uh, how we spend our time, uh, with whom we spend our time, how much time we spend with other people, all that kind of stuff. It seems to me that, that it's a teachable moment. I don't really like that term, but it's a teachable moment saying we got away from that as a culture. And it left us massively exposed. Remember, human beings die in isolation quicker. That was true. That's true today. It was true during the caveman periods. It's always been. It's always been true. But in the United States, in the last forty years, particularly, I think we've kind of had this idea like old rules don't apply to us, and we can just go it alone. And my feeling is that these epidemics are teaching us that 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 what ways of getting get, getting back to the root of the book the, the least of us comes from my reading of the book of matthew in the bible and jesus saying to his disciples um that which you do for the least of my brethren you do for me and meaning pay attention to the most vulnerable go out of your way to understand how how uh, uh how they need to be helped and and i think as a culture we kind of i don't know moved away from that and Jesus understood the necessity of that. I think people all through through history have understood the necessity of that. It's just in America we've kind of moved away from it, and the symptom is uh, the the result is what we're seeing on the on the streets. Thank you for sharing that message about hope and community, Sam. Our first Welcome. audience question comes from Ashley, and they ask: In writing your book, how would you advise a fellow aspiring author to capture the breath and emotion of stories such as you have? How do you deal with capturing people's life stories? You know, it's a great question, Ashley, and thank you for for asking it. And it, it could go, we could do whole classes on this. In fact, I'm teaching a class at Vanderbilt right now, which kind of like deals with this very issue. But but basically, my feeling is that you um, you you uh, attempt to understand the, the the breadth of the topic you're dealing with, and then you find stories that that illustrate that. That, that And then when you find those stories and those stories hit you, has to hit you first. You have to say like, holy crap, that is an amazing story. And I have a very, I think, very highly, fine, very fine-tuned sense of what a great story is now after 35 years of doing this. I, 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 if it, it amazes me, if all I want to do is tell people about it immediately, then I got to tell that story. It's, it sounds... And, and then it becomes a question of taking that story and doing, you know, and not letting it go, doing numerous, numerous interviews. The way I work is I write and report at the same time. So if I go to some town where there's a person I want to talk to, I will interview that person, I'll, a doctor in West Virginia, for example, that I interviewed. I'll go there and I'll do a couple of phone calls ahead of time to him understand a little bit about the basic stories, go out there, drive around with them, see the town with them, talk to them for two hours, go back to my little hotel, transcribe, write, 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 go back at them the next day with new questions and do that process may, as many days as I can if I'm, in, if I'm in town. Meanwhile, I'm writing kind of chunks of text, checks, chunks of prose, which may never make it into, the, into a book or a story that I happen to be working on. But if I need to be writing in order to understand what I don't have, to understand what, I, what the story can be, and I cannot wait for a month or two to finish up everything for that to happen. I have to do it right then. Now, that's how I work. And to me, that is really the essence of, of when, you can, when you do that, then you start getting into that. I think it's been a very successful way of, for me anyway, it's been very successful. Other people have other uh, ways of working. But I think it's extraordinarily important to do that because you have to always, you know, I have to be there with the person. And then I have to write to understand what the story is and what I'm missing too. That's a big part of it. And sometimes you can only do it, you know, like, when you're there, you can only ask what what did that building that you you uh, have your office? What did that building used to be? You know what what was there before that kind of thing. Minor questions maybe, but they become very very important. And and in, in, in telling someone's story of where that person this this doctor for example um, lived and and how he got involved and all he got involved in and that kind of thing. So that's how I work. It's finding the stories, reporting them out doing a lot of work on the phone and then going out to the person's place and, or town or what have you, neighborhood, and, and getting to know that person in, in, a, in a deeper way. That process is time consuming. 
and you got to have the money and the the ability to to get out there and all that kind of stuff but but to me there's no other way of doing these kinds of stories you have to be you have to be with people and you have to be with them repeatedly you know i wrote a story about what it is in uh in la for the la times why it is that all the independent donut shops in los angeles southern california really are, are run by chinese cambodians right why is that you can look this up if you do a, a, a google search for me and donuts and cambodians you'll find the story that i wrote and and uh the guy who was kind of the cambodian donut king the guy who started all the Cambodian refugees in this was a Chinese Cambodian man um, from uh, from uh, Phnom Penh, and and um, I interviewed that guy nine times, nine times to get his full story. So it it involves some immersion in the person. That's that's the key thing. But I believe in writing and reporting at the same time. Some people don't; they wait. That's their thing. I can't do that. Thank you, Sam. That is actually all the time we have this evening, but thank you again for joining us and for answering all of my questions. I will now pass it on to Lucy to close off the event. Thank you, Aaliyah. And thank you so much for those incredible insights, Sam. Um, with that, oh, waiting for the screen. Um, with that, at every event, we'd like to thank our speakers with the custom made poster. And tonight is no different. <laughs> uh, Yes, uh, this poster was made. I by love you. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> of course. Actually, this um, poster was made by um, one of our communications team members, Monet. And after this event, we'll have Riley get your mailing address and we'll be able to send one over to you physically. That would be great. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for coming. We really enjoyed <laughs> having you. And Thanks. yeah. There's a lot of events that go um, behind our events at the forum, or a lot of work that goes behind all of our events at the forum. So I'd first like to recognize our incredible event manager of the night, Riley, our poster designer, designer Monet, communications lead, Ashley, technology lead, Amanda, and of course, our moderator, Aaliyah. And yeah, our next event is with Kevin Tan, who is the CEO and founder of Snack Pass, and we will have him March 10th at 6 p.m. at a pending venue on campus. And thank you so much for coming to our event. Um, if you have any feedback for us, please feel free to use our feedback form, which is linked there. Um, there's also a QR code on the um, right side. And for more events, please like us on Facebook to stay updated on what we're doing. And also please feel free to visit our website. And with that, I'd like to say that I hope everyone has a lovely evening. And I'd like to thank Sam one more time for coming and for such a great event. And um, everybody have a good rest of your night.